For this session, I want to talk about the First Amendment, but particularly uh, a particular clause of the First Amendment, the Free Exercise Clause. But before we do that, we have to realize that that's not the only clause in the First Amendment that deals with religion. So let me just read those two clauses together and maybe challenge you to think about how the two clauses might clash together sometimes. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, comma, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. They seem like two, and they are, two distinct, one, one distinct prohibition and one right. So government cannot establish a religion. That's not the subject of this talk. Uh, and government cannot uh, make a law respecting, uh, um, uh, prohibiting the free exercise of your religion. But how could they potentially clash together? Well, if government did establish a religion, or we, we imagined some scenario under which one religion was preferred over another, for example, um, which didn't violate that clause. And there are some jurists out there, many, who, who imagine something like that to be possible. Well, that would implicate free exercise issues, potentially. And recognizing some free exercise uh, rights for some religions as opposed to others, as we'll talk about today, might pr privilege certain religions over others. For example, if we recognize and give lots of free exercise rights to a particular form of Christianity, but don't say, give the same ones for a particular form of Satanism, we would implicitly be preferring one over the other. Uh, and it's not that these clash to the point where uh, they're impossible to make sense of, but it is important for us to understand uh, how, how indeterminate they are at times. Nevertheless, today's talk is about the Free Exercise Clause. Um, the Free Exercise Clause, we have to understand it, understand was not really litigated on a national federal level in the big interesting cases that I'll talk about in the 20th century during the 19th century. And the simple answer to that question of why there weren't many cases at all, I mentioned one, uh, on the federal level concerning this issue, what does free exercise mean? What counts as free exercise that would then be protected by the government? It's, the answer to that is simply because the Bill of Rights was not incorporated against the states. Remember, the first word in the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law. It doesn't say South Dakota shall make no law or Virginia shall make no law. It says Congress shall make no law. So if Congress wasn't making any laws and we didn't understand this right to be as binding on the states as it is on the federal government, there's no issue and there's no cases. We do have some. Uh, one is uh, Reynolds versus United States uh, in 1875, which is a uh, a federal law uh, banning polygamy. Uh, and banning polygamy, again, the question here was, is it, polygamy is a free exercise of my religion as a member of the Church of Latter-day Saints. Um, the government, though, does not recognize that as legitimate and makes an important distinction that will continue through free exercise cases in the future, up until today. And that is the distinction between thought and action. Okay. So, the court says it's one thing to have free exercise of thought about your religion and your religious beliefs and tenets. Right? It's another thing, though, under the Constitution, and it's very important to make this distinction between the actions that you would take in support of or following through with certain beliefs or tenets. The court would say you have, and, and by the way, they use this distinction, too, in free speech cases as well. You have the freedom of thought in terms of exercise. So it would certainly be uh, unconstitutional for us to have um, you know, the, the Catholic Church come in and make everybody, force everybody to convert or vice versa or something like that. Um, but we have to make a distinction between freedom of thought as exercise right, and free exercise as action. So again, that, that, was, that case was upheld by the court and that distinction there, there was some overriding, uh, uh, more important, compelling purpose that the federal government had that overrode uh, or trumped uh, the free exercise action interest of Mormons. And I hope that distinction between thought and action is clear. The court is not making any kind of substantive um, judgment about uh, polygamy as a, as a, as a, as a, as a theoretical or religious thought uh, that you might have or belief that you may have. They're talking about the action that might result from thought. 
But as the Supreme Court began to interpret other provisions, particularly of the First Amendment in the 1920s, Gitlo, for example, Gitlo versus New York incorporates the free speech clause against the states, uh, it is soon thereafter uh, that the free exercise and establishment clauses are applied to the states. And again, the idea here, through the idea of incorporation is that the certain provisions of the Bill of Rights will apply to the states and be as binding on them as they are and always have been uh, binding against the national government. So states cannot establish a religion. States cannot uh, burden your free exercise of religion. Same question remains, though, what does free exercise mean? How are we to understand it? The case that incorporated the free exercise clause against the states is a case called Cantwell versus Connecticut. Uh, in 1940. And this is one of many free exercise cases uh, that involved uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses who are absolutely crucial to the development of civil liberties in the United States because they are such a marginalized and controversial uh, group. Uh, and what Mr. Cantwell did was uh, he and his two sons were wa would walk around New Haven, Connecticut, where, where Yale is. Uh, they would walk around New Haven and try and knock on doors and stop people on street corners and proselytize to them. They would do it in a, in a kind of interesting and kind of in-your-face way, too. Uh, they would actually carry a phonograph with them at the time, and they would stop somebody. They would, they would say, would you like to hear? You know, anybody's witnessed anybody who has had tracks, and they hand them to you. Would you like to hear what I have to say? And they put, they put the record on. And this was a, uh, an anti-religion uh, message that was being delivered, um, uh, but particularly in, uh, an anti-Catholic message that was being delivered. Uh, if anybody's been to New Haven, you know there's a large Catholic Italian-American community there. Uh, Mr. Cantwell made the decision to go take his record player <laughs> into <laughs> the Catholic community. Uh, and uh, these two men that he was witnessing to uh, were not happy. And there was almost a fight. There was almost a fight. Uh, nevertheless, he, he was fined um, for uh, not getting uh, the right license to go out and do this. Uh, he took his case all the way to the Supreme Court and won. And the court said, you cannot. Uh, um, have uh, some individual administrator, like a mayor or a city council member, or even some appointed uh, person in the, in the city, in the city office, deciding who gets a permit and who doesn't in terms of religion. Uh, and so, not only is 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 that statute uh, unconstitutional, but the court applies uh, the free exercise clause uh, to the states. Uh, th what that then means, though, it's important uh, to understand that. If we apply a portion of the Bill of Rights to the states, the court is going to give that strict scrutiny, just as it would always have given it strict scrutiny on the federal level. So now it becomes really difficult. Strict scrutiny is the highest level of scrutiny that a court will give. There has to be a compelling uh, state interest, and uh, that interest and the way that the law is structured has to be narrowly tailored to, to achieve a legitimate end. And that becomes very difficult then for states, um, for any law that's challenged as violative of a fundamental right in the Bill of Rights to pass constitutional muster. Uh, the application of strict scrutiny is almost always fatal. In other words, it almost always, uh, the court almost always rules laws unconstitutional that, uh, in which they use the, the, the doctrine of strict scrutiny. So free exercise, strict scrutiny on the state level. And the next big case that comes along is in 1963, a case called Sherbert versus Werner. And this is a case that's representative of the problem and, and really the argument uh, that will characterize the free exercise debate uh, from the 60s even up until today. And that is whether otherwise generally applicable laws are fatal if they happen to burden your free exercise rights. The kind of language that the court will use will be significantly burdened. So here in Sherbert is, 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 is one of the best examples. Um, South Carolina has uh, uh, unemployment, and, uh, unemployment compensation. Um, this woman is a Seventh-day Adventist. She works in a, in a, in a, in a mill, in a uh, textile mill. And her Sabbath day is a Saturday. She can't work on a Saturday, and she's fired. She applies for insurance or for, for unemployment insurance. She's denied the benefits because one of the provisions in there is that you must actively you must actively seek and accept work when it's offered to you. Right? 
but her Sabbath prevents her from being qualified or does not make her attractive at all to any employer down there who's running their mill on Saturday. Maybe it's the biggest day and they want everybody there. So she's denied unemployment compensation. Well, the court, here, here's the, the real challenge here. This was not a law passed, and, and nobody made the argument that any member of the South Carolina State Legislature or any member of, of, the, of, of the state agency that was heading up the unemployment uh, system there had any intent whatsoever uh, to, to deprive anybody of the free exercise of their religion in this case. It was a generally applicable law. It applied to everyone equally. Everybody uh, was, was held to the same standards and was bound by the law in the same way in its provisions and would get its benefits if it followed the rules and wouldn't if it didn't. So here's the challenge. To what extent uh, are generally applicable laws, um, how should we look at them when they do seem to impact um, the free exercise of religion? Here the court said that this was unconstitutional and that she should get unemployment compensation. Um, this idea uh, of generally applicable laws having the potential to, to, to uh, violate free exercise um, would be reaffirmed um, just a few years later in the early 1970s in a case called Wisconsin versus Yoder. Uh, involving the Amish. Um, the Amish, or the state of Wisconsin, required that all children go to uh, grade school uh, um, or to school up until a certain age. Um, the Amish did not believe, though, that, that, child, that their children needed to go to high school. They believed they needed to go to grade and, and to portions of middle school, uh, but they didn't believe that they needed to learn anything for their way of life past uh, a certain age. And that age conflicted with the state's uh, requirement. Again, the same kind of ideas going on. We have an otherwise generally applicable law. Nobody was making the argument that the state of Wisconsin um, passed this law to harm um, the Amish community. It just happened to be the case that the, that the way that the law operates in, is harming the Amish community, at least in their eyes, that it's, that it's abridging their free exercise rights. Um, the court sided with the Amish. Um, the court said that it uh, that, they, that there should be an exception, uh, and that the state's interest in education um, here uh, was, was not so uh, compelling that, um, in other words, it wasn't the fact that the, that the Amish weren't sending their kids to school at all. Uh, you know, they were learning, as the Amish, uh, as the lawyers uh, for uh, Yoder said, uh, the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. That's all we would need. It's not that they're rejecting that at all. They just have a different idea of what uh, age is, is appropriate for education. So, you know, by, by the late 1970s, early 1980s, what is the state of free exercise jurisprudence in the United States? It, it, is, it gets strict scrutiny, um, and even generally applicable laws, um, if they significantly burden free exercise, can violate the First Amendment and will be found unconstitutional. That is until 1990, uh, in a very, very seminal case called Employment Division versus Smith out of the state of Oregon. This is a case replete with ironies. This is a case of, and, and it's similar to Sherbert versus Werner in the sense that this was somebody who was, two people who were terminated from their jobs um, and, and denied unemployment compensation. It just happened to be that the two people who were terminated from their jobs uh, worked at a drug rehabilitation facility, and they were terminated for the ingestion of illegal controlled substances. They were American Indians um, who ingested peyote. Now, the Oregon state law says, you know, if you, if you do this, you're not going to get the unemployment benefits. Um, the, the, the controversial part of this case is that, uh, led interestingly enough by Justice Scalia, uh, was that the court lowered the scrutiny level a little bit for free exercise cases. Right? This was a generally applicable law. Now before, in the other two examples that we had seen so far, even generally applicable laws could run afoul of the free exercise clause. It's clear what, and, and the majority of the court went to great length to say that generally applicable laws, if, not, if you don't follow generally applicable laws and you use the free exercise clause, you will become a law unto yourself and you will invite anarchy into the system, into the country. Um, so 
again, it, there was a little bit of a lowering of, of the scrutiny level with which the court used uh, to resolve these sorts of cases. So what happens next? Well, Congress gets involved. And in 1993, passes the, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, RFRA, compelling saying to the court, when you get these cases in the future, you are not to use anything but, the, but strict scrutiny. Do not lower that scrutiny level that you're using to resolve these cases. Well, a case comes up, City of Bernie versus Flores, about a, about a Catholic church in the city of Bernie, Texas, um, that was, a historic, it was deemed a historical uh, uh, landmark. And what does the court say? The court says, no, 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 Congress. Um, only the court, only, uh, only we can decide what level of scrutiny we're going to use. Um, this had to do with the 14th Amendment because we have the 14th Amendment. Uh, it's through the 14th Amendment that, that the Bill of Rights are incorporated against the states. Um, at the same time, though, so, so, so the court said, we're going to make our own, our own judgment. But that didn't mean that, that, that they were gutting the protection of free exercise because in the very same year, um, Another interesting case, the, free, if the line of cases in the free exercise clause uh, are, are fascinating and fun to read. Uh, the Church of Lakumi, uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, the city of Hialeah versus the Church of Lakumi Babaluai uh, outside of Miami. Um, this is a church that practiced the Santer Santeria religion, uh, voodoo, and they had uh, animal sacrifice. But the city of Hialeah, Florida had passed ordinances that really when you look at them, and we don't have time to read all of them, weren't, when you, most of you would agree, weren't generally applicable. There were ordinances when, the, when you read them looked like they were designed particularly to, to apply to the Santeria religion in the church of Lakumi Babaluai. Um, it talked about killing chickens, or not, not, not killing chickens, and things like that. Uh, and there was some evidence even introduced that the, led, that, that the city council members who introduced this bill had them in mind. Now that runs afoul of the free exercise clause. The court still said, even though they had, in a sense, kind of lowered um, free exercise uh, analysis from strict scrutiny to something uh, a little lower. And that's where we really stand right now. The free exercise clause um, and, and this, this question of, of what level of scrutiny it should get, whether otherwise, gen the extent to which otherwise generally applicable laws when they run afoul of free exercise um, uh, should be understood as, as uh, maybe a balancing test with state interests, national or, or state, um, and this distinction between thought and action, uh, to how, how far are we going to, or where do we draw the line between thought and action? Thank you. Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from Woody Young and the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu.